Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's a pleasure to see you. Um, and it's a pleasure on behalf of uh, Applied, the study of Applied Philosophy, to welcome all of you to this seminar uh, on the problem of evil. Um, in particular, it's a great pleasure to welcome Professor Dr. William Lane Craig. I have personally been looking forward to your visit and to, and to the, your lectures here today at Aalborg University. Uh, Dr. Craig received a Bachelor of Arts degree in communication uh, from Wheaton College, Illinois in 1971 and uh, two summer cum laude master's uh, degrees uh, in 1975 uh, in philosophy of religion and um, ecclesi ecclesiastical uh, uh, history. And he earned his uh, PhD uh, at uh, the University of Birmingham in uh, 1977 and a doctoral degree in theology at the University of Munich in Germany uh, in uh, 1984. Dr. Craig um, has worked at various universities and since uh, 1996 uh, he has held a position as research professor of philosophy at Biola University, California. Dr. Craig has written a number of books and scientific papers. The list of publication, publications is very, very long. <laughs> In particular, uh, he has uh, contributed significantly to the philosophy of time and uh, uh, also to the philosophy of religion today. Uh, William Bain Craig is going to lecture on one of the most uh, important problems within the philosophy of, of religion, the problem of evil. Dr. Craig, we are looking forward to your lectures. Thank you, Peter. Uh, before we begin, can you all hear me? Is the uh, microphone good? All right. Well, we are in the second quarter of a speaking tour of Nordic uh, countries uh, at various universities. My wife, Jan, who is with me, and I have just come from Finland, where uh, we had a wonderful time at the university in Helsinki, and now are delighted to be here in Alborg. And especially are so appreciative of Peter Ostrom and his uh, work in philosophy. Uh, it's been just great to uh, have a, a friendship with Peter over the years, and so we are really grateful for the invitation to come and deliver this seminar today. Our uh, format to today, for today will be to have uh, a couple of hours in the morning and then a couple in the afternoon with an hour break for lunch around noon. And what we'll do is I will uh, give you some material and then open it for questions periodically uh, so that we can discuss any uh, issues you'd like to raise or objections or, or points of clarification. So uh, I'll let you know when uh, it's time to ask questions. Uh, and I hope that that will give us ample opportunity for discussion. Well then, to begin, the problem of innocent suffering, or as it's uh, known among philosophers as the problem of evil, is certainly the greatest obstacle to belief in the existence of God. When I ponder the extent and the depth of human suffering in the world, uh, whether due to man's own inhumanity to man, which has certainly been in the news recently, or due to natural disasters, then I have to confess that I find it hard to believe in God. 
And perhaps many of you have felt the same way. Maybe we should just all become atheists. But that would be a pretty big step to take, wouldn't it? Um, maybe it all uh, fits into some sort of grand scheme of things. Maybe there's a good reason that God permits the evil and suffering in the world. How can we be sure that God does not exist after all? Maybe the suffering for the world is part of God's plan for humanity, which we can only dimly discern, if at all. How can we be sure? Well, as a Christian theist, I'm persuaded that the problem of evil, as terrible as it is, does not, in the end, constitute a disproof of the existence of God. On the contrary, in fact, I think that Christian theism is man's last best hope of a solution to the problem of evil. Now, in order to explain why I think this, it will be helpful to draw some distinctions to help keep our thinking clear. Now, first and foremost, we need to distinguish between what is called the intellectual problem of evil and the emotional problem of evil. The intellectual problem of evil concerns how to give a rational explanation of the coexistence of God and evil. By contrast, the emotional problem of evil concerns how to uh, dissolve people's emotional dislike of a God who would permit terrible suffering in the world. The intellectual problem of evil lies in the province of the philosopher. The emotional problem of evil lies in the province of the pastor or the counselor. And I think it's very important to distinguish between these two versions of the problem because the solution to the intellectual problem of evil is apt to appear dry and uncaring to someone who is actually going through terrible emotional pain. On the other hand, the solution to the emotional problem of evil may appear superficial and inadequate to someone who is contemplating it as an abstract philosophical question. So I think it's quite important that we distinguish between the intellectual problem of evil and the emotional problem of evil. And I suspect, frankly, that for most people, the problem of evil is really an emotional problem, not really an intellectual problem. I think that most people have not really thought very deeply about this question, but simply react emotionally to the suffering that they experience or see in the world uh, and react negatively against God. Well, you might say, then, why deal with the intellectual problem of evil? Well, simply because um, unless we can deal with people's intellectual objections or uh, questions, the uh, emotional problem of evil will not come to the surface, will not be solved. People will think the question is intellectual, uh, and therefore it needs to be addressed squarely. So let's talk first about the intellectual problem of evil. And as you can see, there are two versions of this problem. Um, and these are differently labeled by different philosophers. Usually, they're called the logical version of the problem of evil uh, versus the probabilistic version of the problem of evil, or the uh, logical version versus the evidential version of the problem of evil. I have differentiated them sometimes by uh, calling it the internal problem of evil versus the external problem of evil. Well, what are these different versions? Well, according to the logical version of the problem of evil, it is logically impossible for God and evil to coexist. If God exists, then evil cannot exist. If evil exists, then God cannot exist. They are like the irresistible force and the immovable object 
They cannot both exist in the same world. So on this view, there is no possible world in which God and the evil and suffering in the world coexist. And since it's obvious that evil and suffering do exist, it therefore follows that God does not exist. So this would be an argument for atheism based upon the incompatibility of the existence of God and the existence of the suffering and evil in the world. And the reason I have called this an internal problem of evil is because the belief that evil exists is part and parcel of uh, classical theism, particularly Christian theism. Christians believe uh, that evil is real, that sin is real, that uh, people actually do evil things. And so Christians are committed by their worldview to the reality of evil. Unlike, for example, Hindus, who believe that evil is merely illusory, that the distinction between good and evil is part of the realm of maya, or the realm of illusion, that ultimately evil is not real. Christians believe that evil is real, all too real. And so this is an internal problem, in a sense, for Christian theists, because we are committed to the reality of evil, and if evil and God are logically incompatible with each other, then our worldview has a contradiction at its very heart. Our worldview is logically incoherent. We affirm two logically incompatible things, namely that God exists and that the evil uh, in the world exists. So this logical version of the problem of evil can also be understood, as I say, as an internal problem for Christian theists. Now, what one might, might want, oh, and then the, the probabilistic version of the problem of evil. Uh, this would say that it is improbable that, the, that God and e e the evil in the world coexist. That is to say, yes, there may be a logically possible world in which God and evil coexist, but nevertheless, given the evil in the world, it's highly unlikely that God exists. It's highly improbable that God exists. The evil and suffering in the world is such that it's highly improbable God could have morally sufficient reasons for allowing it to occur. And so given the evil and suffering in the world, it's improbable, if not impossible, that God exists. And as I say, I call this sometimes the external problem of evil, because although the Christian is committed to the reality of evil, he is not committed to the reality of unnecessary or pointless evil, or as it's sometimes called, gratuitous evil. Uh, gratuitous evil would be evil that is unnecessary and pointless, evil for which God has no morally sufficient reason to allow. And the Christian is not committed to that. So that's not an internal problem. Uh, the Christian is not committed as part of his worldview to the reality of gratuitous evil or pointless, unnecessary evil. So this probabilistic version could be seen as an external challenge to Christian theism. Given the apparently gratuitous evil in the world, it is improbable that God exists. So those are the two versions of the problem, the logical version and the probabilistic version. Now, before we discuss these, let me ask if there's any question of a comprehension uh, type uh, concerning these distinctions. Any question that you have uh, about understanding these distinctions that uh, you would like to ask, any clarification? Okay, then uh, these distinctions are, are clearly understood, I take it. Let's talk then first about the logical version of the problem of evil. The question is, uh, is there a logical contradiction or incompatibility between the statements, an all-loving, all-powerful God exists, and... B, 
uh, the suffering in the world exists. Are these two statements, in fact, logically uh, incompatible with each other as the atheist claims, who presses the logical version of the problem of evil? Well, the difficulty for the atheist here is that there is no explicit contradiction between A and B. Uh, B is not the negation of A. Um, it is not the contradictory of A. So there's no explicit contradiction between affirming that an all-loving, all-powerful God exists and that suffering or evil exists. So if the atheist is to maintain that A and B are logically incompatible, he must be making some hidden assumptions that would uh, serve to bring out the implicit contradiction and make, them ex make it explicit. He must be saying that even though A and B are not explicitly contradictory, there's an implicit contradiction between A and B. And that means there must be some hidden assumptions that he's making that would bring out this contradiction and make it explicit. And the question is, what are those hidden assumptions? Well, they seem to be um, the following. One, if God is all-powerful, then he can create any world that he wants. And two, if God is all-loving, he prefers a world without suffering. Now, since A affirms that God is all-powerful and all-loving, it means that God both can create uh, a world without suffering and evil, and that he would prefer such a world. Since God both can uh, create such a world and he would prefer such a world, it follows that if A is true, then suffering or evil does not exist. So, if one and two are true, uh, that would seem to be the hidden assumptions that would render A and B contradictory. So, the question is, are assumptions one and two necessarily true? Now, notice that to prove that there is no logically possible world in which God and suffering coexist, one and two both have to be necessarily true. For there to be no logically possible world where God and suffering both exist, one and two have to be necessarily true. But are they necessarily true? Well, let's think about them. What about number one? If God is all-powerful, uh, is it necessarily true that he can create any world that he wants? Well, it seems to me that this is not necessarily true. Now, I'm looking for a piece of chalk here. Do we have any... Uh, is this good enough? <laughs> I don't know if that is good enough, Peter. I, uh, I might want to have a, a bigger piece oh, wow. if you can find it. Uh, let's, let's let these circles uh, represent various possible worlds that God could have created. Um, let's call them W1, uh, W2, W3, and W4, and, and so on. These are various possible worlds in, uh, that, God, uh, are, that are logically possible for God to create. And let's suppose that uh, in one of these worlds, uh, if Peter were in a certain set of circumstances, he would do some evil act. Um, in W3, he is in identically the same circumstances, but since it's logically possible for him not to do that act, uh, oh, thank you. Yes. In W3, in the same set of circumstances, he freely refrains from committing that evil act. So, in W2, in one set of circumstances, he does the evil act. In W3, in the same set of circumstances, uh, 
He refrains from doing that evil act. Now, is it true that God can just actualize any possible world that he wants? Well, no, because it may be the case that if Peter were in those circumstances, that he would freely do the evil act. And the only way that God would be able to prevent him from freely doing that evil act would be to change the circumstances, to interfere, to prevent him from doing that evil act. Because it's Peter and not God who determines what he freely does, W3 will not be actualizable by God. It is Peter who determines whether or not the evil act occurs, not God. Given that he grants to Peter significant freedom in those circumstances to do what he wants, W3 is not actualizable by God. So philosophers will uh, often refer to these worlds as possible worlds. These worlds are logically possible, but that doesn't mean that every logically possible world is feasible for God. Um, so we can imagine uh, another set of possible worlds, and this will be a subset of the set of all possible worlds. And these are often called feasible worlds. Worlds that are feasible for God to actualize given the way uh, human creatures would freely choose. And as you can see, W3 drops out of the set of feasible worlds. Although W3 is a logically possible world, it's not a feasible world for God. Why? Because if Peter were in exactly those circumstances, he would freely choose to do what is evil. And therefore, uh, W2 would be actual. So W3, though logically possible, is not a world which is feasible for God. And therefore, it follows that one is not necessarily true. Uh, it is logically impossible to make someone freely do something. That is as logically impossible as making a round square or a married bachelor. So omnipotence or being all-powerful doesn't mean the ability to do logical impossibilities. So even though God is all-powerful, that does not imply that he can create any world that he wants. Uh, there are worlds which are logically possible, but they are not feasible for God given the way human creatures would freely choose in various sets of circumstances. So the first assumption is simply not necessarily true. It is not true that in virtue of being all powerful, uh, God can simply create any world that he wants. Now let me just say one other thing about this. If you do have a very radical understanding of what it means to be all, all powerful and you say, well, if a being is all-powerful, he should be able to make contradictions come true. He should be able to actualize uh, uh, someone's freely doing something or make, make that person freely do something. Well, then, then the problem of evil dissolves immediately because if God can make logical contradictions true, uh, then he can bring it about that there is a world in which he exists and in which evil exists, even though evil is logically incompatible with his existence. So that would hardly be a good way for the atheist to try to escape or, uh, this problem of, of defending assumption one. Uh, if you adopt the definition of omnipotence whereby God can do anything, uh, even logical contradictions, then the problem of evil just vanishes. But if you agree, as virtually all theologians and philosophers do, that omnipotence does not mean the ability to do the logically impossible, then it is logically impossible to make someone freely do something. And so given that human agents would freely choose differently in different circumstances, there is going to be a significant difference between worlds that are possible and worlds that are feasible for God. And so, assumption one is not necessarily true. 
Any question about the that point with regard to assumption number one? Yes, down here. Yes. Um, couldn't God create a universe to which all circumstances are in a way that we choose freely, they choose to do something right? Could God create a world which everyone would freely choose to do something right? Like he put the circumstances. Yes. Like he make the circumstances that I will freely choose what is right. Right. There is certainly a possible world somewhere where everybody always chooses to do the right thing. Because that is logically possible, right? Mm. That's logically possible. That everyone in every moral situation in which he finds himself chooses to do the right thing. And so there would never be evil in such a world. It would be a sinless world. Yes, that's possible. But you see, it may not be feasible. It may be that in every world of uh, moral agents in which people find themselves in moral circumstances, that they the someone would go wrong at some point and not do the right thing. So it may be that even though a sinless world is possible in and of itself, it's not feasible for God. And if that's the case, then one is simply not necessarily true. Yeah. Uh, my question was, people choose to do evil because of a given circumstance. Because of what? A given circumstance he finds himself in. Because of the given circumstances? Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, but what if there were only, if all the circumstances were in a way that the person makes the right choices? All right, well, not, I, I'll repeat the question. The concern is that people make their choices within certain circumstances. So I think you're saying that by fiddling with the circumstances, God could bring about the person would always choose the right thing. The important thing to remember here is that these are freedom permitting circumstances. We mustn't think of the circumstances as causally determining how people will choose. In other words, this distinction is assuming the reality of libertarian freedom, that you're not determined. And it's saying that if libertarian freedom is possible, and that certainly seems to be the case, then, it, then this distinction between possible worlds and feasible worlds comes into play. And then there's just no guarantee that there is any feasible world in which God fiddles with the circumstances so that everybody always would freely do the right thing. Now certainly he could make a deterministic world in which everybody did what he determined to do, but that wouldn't be a morally significant world. That would be a puppet world or a robot world in which really good and evil don't even exist. Any other comment or question? Yes. Uh, I wonder, we are often talking about uh, making the assumption that, uh, that God is all-powerful, but uh, is this... Uh, assumption really necessary in the sense that uh, God may be powerful in the way that in the long run, in the end, he may, he proves his own uh, omnipotence, mm -hmm. but uh, as it is now, we are still in a process. Yeah. It seems to me that sometimes we have an assumption, and even in the Bible, perhaps sometimes it's a bit dubious whether the om omnipotence uh, Effect. Is so I am yes. working here with the classical conception of God according to which God is all powerful or omnipotent and he is all good. Now certainly one could try to escape the problem of evil by compromising on classical theism and, and denying A and say no God is limited in his power or he's limited in his goodness uh, which would really be radical and that would escape the problem and there have been some thinkers that have done that I uh, can think of uh, one author for example who under the pressure of the problem of evil denies divine omnipotence but I don't think there's any reason to make that compromise myself it, it seems to me that classical theism uh, which affirms God's omnipotence and um, uh, all goodness, uh, is logically compatible with 
evil. Uh, and if classical theism is, then it, a fortiori, so will be some weaker theism that denies omnipotence or God's being all good. So I think it's best to start with the strongest conception of God and, and work from there. Any other question about this first uh, assumption? Yes, down here. I assume that, that you will uh, elaborate more on uh, the whole uh, issue of uh, free will, since uh, I think you, you took a standpoint from the beginning where you actually talk about the free will as yeah. a, as a <laughs> Well, I, I haven't intended to. Uh, my assumption is that we're working uh, on the problem of evil with classical theism, which affirms as I say, things like God's omnipotence and his um, all goodness. And then I'm assuming that human beings are logically possibly free, that it's, that it's logically possible for human beings to be free. And actually, this, this would be available even to the determinist, say a person who's a strong, reformed theologian or a Calvinist. As long as the Calvinist is willing to say that it's possible that human beings are free, uh, then this will still answer the logical version of the problem of evil. That the Calvinists could say, I don't in fact believe that human beings are free. I think everything is determined by God. But nevertheless, insofar as it's logically possible that human beings have freedom, it will follow then that assumption one is not necessarily true, and that's all you need to do to dissolve the logical version of the problem of evil. So I'm just going to assume that it's logically possible that human beings are free. And if the atheist would, wants to deny that, then he's going to have to expose some logical incoherence in the idea of libertarian freedom, and I, I'm not sure how he could do that. Then, then he's really having to take a radical line if he's going to maintain it's logically impossible to have uh, freedom of the will. All right, well, so that means that the logical version of the problem of evil is already invalid because it assumes that one is necessarily true and it's not. But what about assumption number two, that if God is all loving, he prefers a world without suffering. Is that necessarily true? Well, again, as I think about it, it seems to me that that's not necessarily true. We all know cases in which we permit suffering because of some greater good that we have in mind, some end. Every parent knows this. Um, with your children, you cannot save them from every mishap or scrape or accident uh, otherwise, they would never learn to be mature, responsible adults. They would be permanently infantile uh, if you constantly were intervening all the time. So we all know situations in which we allow suffering and evil uh, to take place because we have some uh, justifying end in mind that allows us to permit that. And similarly, God might have justifying ends in mind for why he would prefer a world that has suffering in it. Um, C.S. Lewis, the British author, uh, once remarked, what do people mean when they say, I am not afraid of God because I know that he is good? Have they never even been to the dentist? <laughs> and of course, when Lewis wrote that, when you went to the dentist, they didn't have Novocaine in those days. They just drilled on your teeth. I remember those days myself. Uh, and yet the dentist is not evil. He has some greater good in mind um, by which he permits this suffering in, in your life. And similarly, God might have some greater end in mind in permitting the suffering in the world. So uh, again, it's just not necessarily true that in virtue of being all loving, God would uh, always prefer a world that is free of suffering and evil. So neither of these assumptions seems to be necessarily true. Um, is there any comment or question anyone has on that second assumption before we proceed? 
Why that's not necessarily true, yes. Would it then be possible for Adam pre fall to fall and break a leg? Uh, that's, I mean, that's, that's a good question. I don't see any incompatibility with that and God's goodness. Uh, in my, the question was, could Adam, uh, in the Bible, prior to the fall into sin, could he have stumbled over a, a root or, and, and fallen down and broken his leg? Um, it seems to me that it's not at all unlikely that in a natural world, Adam would have to contend with the problems that working in a physical world involved. The fire that he might use to cook his food could burn him. Uh, the water that he drinks, if he falls into it, could drown him. Uh, it, it does seem to me that living in a natural world, it, it's not inconsistent with the goodness of God to say that there would be that kind of natural suffering or natural evil, as it's sometimes called. Yes? You'll need to speak louder. Could God have not created a world without any suffering? Yeah, in the physical sense. Oh, in the physical sense. Yes, uh, well, perhaps. That, that would depend on, again, the choices that people make. Because I do think that your free choices are affected by the physical circumstances that you find yourself in. And I think it's not at all improbable that God sometimes may permit physical suffering in our lives, like disease or accidents or mishap, because he knows that it's only in those circumstances that we would freely choose some end which he desires in our lives. So you're right, he, he could make a deterministic world that would be free of suffering without directly affecting the evil in the world. But it might indirectly affect <coughs> evil in the world in that it might be only in the context of physical suffering that agents would freely choose certain ways. And so freedom of the will could even affect so-called natural evil or natural suffering because those go to help make up the circumstances in which people make their free choices. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. Okay. So, it seems to me that the logical version of the problem of evil is doubly invalid. Neither of the crucial assumptions made by the atheist is necessarily true and therefore, the argument is simply an invalid argument. More than that, however, I think we can actually prove that God and evil are logically compatible. That is to say, not only can we show that the atheist has failed to show that they are inconsistent, we can give a positive argument to show that they are consistent. All we have to do is find some third statement, which is, compatible with A and entails B. If we can find a third statement, C, that is logically consistent with A, that God is all-powerful and all-good, and it entails B, that evil exists, then we have shown that A and B are logically consistent. And C seems to be such a, 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 a proposition. God could not have created a world with as much good but less suffering than the actual world, and God has morally sufficient reasons for permitting the suffering that exists. That is consistent with A, and it entails that suffering exists, and therefore it proves that A and B are logically consistent. Now you might say, well that seems pretty improbable, that seems pretty unlikely. Ah, but then you'd be confusing the logical version of the problem of evil with the probabilistic version. C does not need to be probably true. It doesn't need to be plausible. C doesn't even need to be true. C can be a false statement. But as long as C is possibly true and consistent with A, then it will entail B and show A and B to be consistent. 
So don't confuse the logical version of the problem of evil with the probabilistic version. As long as C is consistent uh, with A uh, and, and possibly true, uh, then it entails B and therefore shows A and B to be consistent. And therefore, uh, it seems to me that we have a good uh, argument for showing that, in fact, God and the evil or suffering in the world are consistent. Any question about C, then, and how this dissolves the logical version? Yes? It's really not about C, but it's what if you, you change B to something like um, pointless suffering? <clears throat> yes, if you change B to pointless suffering, then you no longer have an internal problem to Christian theism. Then the, the Christian theist can just deny B. He, he could agree, yes, A and B are incompatible, but I don't believe that pointless suffering exists. See, that turns it into an evidential problem. Um, so uh, that... In, in that case, the theist could admit that A and B are incompatible, but he doesn't believe B is true because he thinks God has sufficient reasons for permitting the suffering. Now that's controversial in the sense that there are Christian theists who do believe that there is pointless suffering or gratuitous suffering. Peter Van Inwagen would be an example of one of these, and if, if they're right, then A and B are not incompatible with each other uh, if B is gratuitous evil exists. But I, 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 I'm assuming that um, the theist could say, no, uh, gratuitous evil does not exist. That, so there'd be a, a, a variety of ways of responding to that. Yes? Can you elaborate a little bit on suffering? Uh, Eugene Peterson says that suffering is pain plus something more. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by suffering? Is that a part of sin or is it... Well, I was taking the term very broadly to mean what C.S. Lewis called the problem of pain. So I'm not sure what the something more is that you're referring to. Uh, whether this is evil uh, in a moral sense, uh, such as when someone does a terrible wrong, or if we're just talking about physical pain, such as when you hit your thumb with a hammer uh, trying to drive a nail, or you, uh, you, you stub your toe, or you have a terrible, horrible accident where you are terribly burned or, or break your limbs. These would be examples of suffering. You, you feel pain. And the question would be, is that kind of pain compatible with the existence of an all-loving and all-powerful God. And I'm suggesting that not only has the atheist failed to show that that's incompatible with an all-loving and all-powerful God, but that on the basis of C, we can actually prove that they are compatible, as long as C is possibly true. Yes, over here. Could you please draw a Venn diagram of suffering and evil? Because sometimes you seem to equate the two and sometimes you distinguish them. Uh huh. Well, um, let's see now, where did my piece of chalk? Oh, here it is. Right, all right. Now, uh, I, you're, that's true. I'm not equating suffering with evil. So let's say. Um, Say this is, yeah, I guess I'm using the word in different ways. If we say that um, that is moral evil, no, I think, yeah, you're right. I think what we have to say this is evil in general. And then what we could say is that this would be, say, uh, natural pain, just natural suffering. And we'd say that some of the, what is called evil in the world is just natural pain. And then, um, yeah, then what would we say? We'd say maybe the rest of it would be moral. I was going to draw another circle, but then that would leave some sorts of evil that are neither moral nor 
neither moral nor natural. So maybe it would look like that, is that we talk about broadly the problem of evil, and this would be composed of either moral evil, or yes, and then there would be some subset that would be natural evil, but would not be moral evil. And I don't know how to draw those proportions, which is greater, I, I, I couldn't say, but is that what you were at thinking? That's what I was thinking. You know. I, I just wanted you to clarify whether there is a distinction between suffering and evil. Yes. Um, right, and so what would we call here? Here, yes, it, well, it's, it's very, the, the terminology is not very happy here because evil sounds to me like a moral quality so that in one sense I think it's a real misnomer to call natural suffering evil. I mean when I fall down and hurt my knee there's nothing evil I, I don't think about that even though it's it's suffering. So it, it's the, the, the whole name, problem of evil, is a, not a, a great terminology, so that's why I sometimes call it the problem of suffering. Um, and there's two types of suffering. There might be suffering that's due to natural pain, but then there's also suffering that is a result of bad moral choices, uh, as when we hurt someone else by doing a sinful action. Yeah. Okay, any other comment on that? It's way in the back. Yeah, what about things like natural disasters? That's not like we're doing all the evil things, but that just kind of comes out of the blue. Well, that's what I drew as the circle for natural evil. That would be floods, yeah, exactly. Exactly. tornadoes, yeah. diseases, accidents. All of those things would be in what we call natural evil. But could we kind of argue that it's just kind of pointless evil? Well, now, the question is, is either the natural evil or the moral evil pointless? Yeah. That will take us over to the evidential problem of evil and suffering, not the logical version. In the, in the, in the logical version, insofar as that's an internal problem, um, the uh, we, are, we are simply asserting that there is evil and suffering in the world. And the Christian theist is committed to that. But the minute you add, as the person over here indicated, the minute you add to be gratuitous suffering or pointless suffering exists, then it's no longer an internal problem. The, the Christian theist can simply deny the truth of be and say, I, I just deny that that's true. So the, the Christian could actually admit that there is a logical incompatibility between the existence of God and pointless evil, but he would deny that there is pointless evil. All right, well, uh, so I'm, I'm very pleased to actually be able to report to you that it is widely recognized by philosophers today, both theists and atheists, that the logical version of the problem of evil has been solved. Um, there are very few atheist philosophers today who would defend the logical version of the problem of evil anymore. It's just too easy to uh, show, as with something like C, that it's logically possible that God and the evil and suffering in the world could coexist. And, and so uh, the, there, this is one of those cases where there has been genuine advance in the field of philosophy. Um, compared to ages past, where the version of the problem of evil that is stated in Epicurus and David Hume, uh, and as recently as J.L. Mackey, uh, that problem is now widely regarded as solved. And that, uh, therefore, uh, the debate today is raging around the probabilistic version of the problem of evil. Uh, the logical version finds very few defenders anymore. Any uh, final comments that you would like to make about the logical version of the problem of evil?
Yes. I have a question. You said uh, a world where all human beings would do uh, moral good decisions is uh, possible but not feasible. Right. Yeah. And what, what about heaven? Okay, very good question. He says, what about heaven? Isn't heaven a world in which you have free agents who always choose to do the right thing? I think there are a couple of ways one might respond to that. I think one might say that heaven is not itself a possible world. Rather, heaven is part of a possible world. Heaven is the final state of those who during their lifetimes have made free decisions to believe in God or, or believe in Christ, and then they are given this immortal uh, and eternal life um, as a result of being related to God. So that presupposes a pre-heavenly veil of decision-making, so to speak. But God couldn't just create heaven de novo without that pre-heavenly veil of, of free decision-making. Um, it's also possible, I think, the Christian might say, that in heaven the freedom to sin is effectively removed. Um, I find this to be a quite plausible option, that God during this veil of decision-making has created us at a sort of distance, a, a kind of epistemic distance or arm's length where we are not overwhelmed by his glory and beauty and, and goodness, and that enables us, in effect, to reject him and his grace if we should so choose. But for the blessed in heaven, who are given the vision of God in all his beauty and majesty and loveliness, it may well be the case that the freedom to sin is effectively removed, that they no longer have the freedom to do evil. Um, it might be like uh, iron filings that are being drawn to a gigantic electromagnet. The, the magnet, uh, the attraction is so great that the filings just cling to it. And it may be that for those who receive the vision of God and his beauty and majesty and goodness, that it is such an overwhelming experience that the ability to do evil is no longer present. And so that would reinforce the idea that during this period of decision-making, God's goodness and glory is veiled, it's concealed, so as to allow the freedom to choose for or against him. But for the blessed in heaven, then, there is no possibility of falling away and doing evil. And it seems to me that that's quite consistent because they've freely chosen that state. They, they have chosen to do that. They're not like robots or, or puppets. Yes? Just a, just a point of support from the scriptures, from the Bible. What you, what you just said is confirmed by uh, the place that says, uh, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Yes, yes. And, and where Paul... St. Paul says in uh, 1 Corinthians 13, Now we see as through a glass darkly, but then face to face. And you can imagine what, well, perhaps we can imagine what that would be like, is when the, 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 the dim mirror would be removed, and instead of seeing this poor reflection, uh, we would see face to face with, with Christ or with God. Uh, I think it does support this idea, you're right. And medieval philosophers often talked about the beatific vision that would be given to the blessed in heaven. They would see the essence of God. And I could well imagine that for those who see the essence of God in that way, that the ability to do evil would just disappear uh, in the face of so attractive a vision. Yes? Well, that's a very good question. Why would Satan or the angels fall away? And I think it would suggest that they had to be created at this epistemic arm's distance as well. Otherwise, an angelic fall would be impossible. So it may well be the case that these beings were also created at an epistemic distance to allow significant freedom uh, to reject God. Um, but that then maybe their decision now has already been sealed 
by a vision of God so that there could be no further angelic fall. Here we're getting into questions of Christian theology, obviously, uh, <laughs> that are, are important, but uh, are related uh, indirectly. All right, any, any other comment on the logical version? Oh, down here, yes. But this notion of epistemic uh, distance, that sounds like there is so, sort of a uh, fine-tuning uh, that, that, that at, at the point where there is a freedom to act that suits God's pe plan. But doesn't God maybe know that if I had not, if I just given a little more revelation of myself, then he would have acted rightly? And that doesn't bring the question back in again. Maybe God, maybe there is this kind of spectrum yeah, yes. Baby, well, certainly there is a spectrum, uh, a point at which the circumstances are no longer freedom permitted. And it's undoubtedly true that there, there is a, a spectrum leading up to that point. But so long as there is uh, a point at which these circumstances would no longer be freedom permitting, then you're going to have this distinction between possible worlds and feasible worlds. Um, and I think we could say some more when we get to the evidential version about the degree to which God fine-tunes these circumstances. Um, because I think it's possible that um, God may, in fact, providentially order the circumstances so that there is no one who could stand before him on the judgment day and say, if only you'd given me a little bit more, then I would have believed and be saved. I think God might well say to that person, no, I knew that even if my revelation to you had been clear, you still would not have believed. Now that presupposes a, a theory of divine knowledge into which maybe we can go later on, but, but let, let's hold that question off. But, but you're right, that is a very interesting and significant question. But in terms of the logical version, at least, as long as we have this distinction between possibility and feasibility, uh, it's going to show that this, this atheistic version of the problem uh, is just invalid. It's not going to work. Yes? Yes, this is, a, again, we're drawing in theological questions that are related, though indirectly. And the question here is, does prayer really make a difference? And I think it does in exactly the way you said, namely, if one were to pray, then God would have done something different than if one were not to pray. Uh, that God in his providence wants to encourage the practice of prayer, and so there are things he would do were someone to pray that he would not have done were they to refuse to pray. Um, and so prayer really makes a difference. It doesn't mean that it changes God's mind, but it, it does mean that, as you say, different worlds might be actual based upon whether or not God knew that someone would, would pray or not. Yes, I, I think that that's correct. Yes? Is God suffering himself because of this? <laughs> well, um, that, okay, we're, I'm going to have to draw the questions, I think, here more tightly because we're, we're getting so far off the track. Does God himself suffer? Um, theologically, one of the attributes of God is impassibility. Uh, and to say that God is impassable means that he cannot suffer. And many of the classical medieval theologians thought that God was impassable because he's pure actuality. He has no passivity and therefore cannot be affected by anything. I think there are very few modern theologians who would accept the idea of divine impassibility. 
it, it seems to be incompatible with the biblical revelation of God as a God who is compassionate, who uh, hurts along with his creatures, who shares their suffering. And I think this will be relevant when we get to the emotional problem of evil, that God shares our suffering with us, and that far from diminishing the greatness of God, that this actually enhances God's greatness. So the question of divine impassibility, I think, will come up again when we talk about the emotional problem as we think of God not as cool and distant and unaffected, but as sharing our suffering with us. So let's, let's wait on that until later. All right, well, I think uh, maybe at this point um, it would be appropriate to take a break for uh, 10 minutes or so, and then we'll turn to the evidential or probabilistic problem of evil.